Syracuse plays NC State on Saturday. It's time for a crossover edition. You are locked on Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Wolfpack fans? What's up, Syracuse Orange fans? Welcome to our special Locked On Crossover Thursday episode. As always, I'm Grayson Boone, joined by former Wolfpack defensive tackle Kenton Gibbs, and we're joined today by the host of Locked On Syracuse, Jackson Holzer. Jackson, how we doing? Well, I'm doing well. How are you guys? We're hanging in there. We Boo, I'm booing you, Jackson. Boo, you're being boo. Boo. I'm already being booed. I haven't even said anything yet. That's okay. <laughs> Many folks that tune in to the weekly uh, ACC squad episodes have probably been waiting for this crossover. In fact, I might just be winding these two up and letting them go, but big time matchup in the ACC on Saturday night. The Syracuse Orange make their way down to Raleigh, North Carolina, 8 p.m. game in Carter Finley. Jackson, we're going to start asking you Syracuse questions, and then we'll flip it over to you so you can ask us NC State questions in the latter half. We'll jump right into it. Fran Brown, first year head coach. He's gotten the Syracuse Orange off to a 4-1 and one start preseason. He'd never been a head coach before. What's the overall feel among Syracuse fans right now? I would say the vibes are pretty high right now. I mean, it was very easy to get down after that week three loss to Stanford. That was a, that was a, they laid an egg on that Friday night. But you know what? This team, obviously, they beat Holy Cross. They took care of business. But then their next real test, you go on the road, you play a ranked opponent in UNLV, First time ranked in program history. And I know that was only a three-point game in overtime, but Syracuse, they controlled that game from start to finish. Now, the special teams, they got to clean that up. But I would say overall, the vibes are really positive around the program now, higher than it's been in a long, long time for Syracuse. Because here's the thing with Fran Brown. We knew he could recruit. His recruiting with Syracuse since taking over is at a 20-year high. For the program. That's not an exaggeration. It's not hyperbole. You can go look up the numbers. The question is, can he coach? And so far, he's got this team at four and one and in good position. And this is a game we're back returning to playing in the ACC right now. You want to contend for the ACC? It starts right now. So let me ask you this. We know about the offense and, and how they pass the ball around and spread the ball around. We know Kyle McCord has been much better than many people, including myself, have expected so far. But what's an underrated part of this team? What's an underrated strength that not many people are talking about that you covering Syracuse as intimately as you do can say, hey, this is something that presents a problem for many teams that for whatever reason, many are just not you know saying, hey, this is the thing with Syracuse. I think it's, they have a lot of weapons, but it's more specifically what I want to get into is their running backs. In the preseason, this was something that was harping on. They got some really good running backs in their system right now, led by LaQuinn Allen and all ACC second teamer last year. Then they also have Will Nixon, a Washington transfer, but he's banged up. He's probably not going to play this week against NC State. But it honestly, with all due respect to Will Nixon, doesn't really matter because they got this kid in Yassine Willis, a true freshman. He is a bowling ball, and he's got some wheels too. He just scored his first career college touchdown. So I don't think enough people talk about their running backs, and it's because of the fact that Kyle McCord is slinging it and they throw the ball more than any other team in this country but when they decide to run the ball, when they decide to commit to it, they are pretty good at it because they got some talented running backs back there. I want to stick on Kyle McCord for just an additional second here. He's fourth in the country in passing yards. He's got over 1,800. Tied for second in the country with 17 pass touchdowns. How has Kyle McCord completely changed the Syracuse offense through five games? It's like a breath of fresh air. This guy is going to shatter every single passing record in one year. He's going to shatter it. I think the record for passing touchdowns held by Ryan Nassib, it's like 25 or 26. He's on pace for 40. And that's not including a potential bowl game or hopefully maybe there's higher aspirations than even that. But really, it's a breath of fresh air because you have faith in him. Look, he's thrown a lot of interceptions so far this season, I think six through five games. But when you're throwing the ball 48 times per game, that's bound to happen. It's not like his interception rate is that high. It's only about two and a half percent. That's not that bad. 
So overall, that is the best way to put it. It's like you, you got faith in him. It's a breath of fresh air. When he makes a mistake, every time he's made a mistake this season, he's bounced back basically on the next drive. That is what it is like with Kyle McCord right now. So let me ask you this. Has Kyle McCord met, exceeded, fallen below your expectations for what you thought he'd be coming in? Oh, he's exceeded. Exceeded by a mile. I mean, I had high expectations for him, higher than most. Because I, I said, you know, coming into the year, I was like, you don't become the Ohio State starting quarterback by accident. You don't put up those numbers at Ohio State by accident. So I was expecting him to come in and put up similar numbers to what he did at Ohio State. And I think every Syracuse fan, including myself, would have taken it. Instead, he's on pace to lead the country maybe in yards and touchdowns. I mean, he's been sensational. I, I really haven't to complain. I haven't had to complain about him really much at all. Has he thrown a couple picks? Yeah, but again, his interceptions rate is not really that high. He generally will make the right read. He generally will put the ball only where the receiver is going to get it. And if you really dig into him a little bit more, he's very, very good at throwing that back shoulder route. Like, very good on it. They have taken advantage of that in a number of games this season. So, yeah, he he's exceeded my expectations. I didn't even see this coming. Earlier this week on Locked on Syracuse, you detailed a couple players that Syracuse is looking to get back into the rotation this weekend. Can you talk about who these players are and what kind of impact they may have Saturday night? Sure. So the first one is Justice Ross Simmons. He is a Colorado State transfer. He had been dealing with a nagging hamstring injury at the at the end of training camp. It bled into the season. He did make his debut against Stanford, but I mean, he was on a a, a Kodai Senga pitch count here. He was only playing like 10 snaps in that game. You barely saw him on the field. I mean, it actually kind of relates because it's like, you know, he throws the ghost fork and he was basically a ghost on the field. You barely saw him. He didn't play against Holy Cross. And then again, he played against UNLV, but he didn't see him. You barely saw him on the field. But Fran Brown said in his post or in his press conference heading into this week that they expect him to be a full go. He was all Mountain West last season with Colorado State. This is a big-time wide receiver. They had to beat out a number of top programs for him. I expect him to be in the rotation at this receiving unit. On defense, they're getting back, hopefully, Marcellus Barnes, a true freshman, a four-star, arguably their top commit in the 2024 cycle. He had been really good through two weeks. He was one of their pro football focus, highest graded defenders as a true freshman. And one of those names was against Georgia Tech. That's an ACC team. And you can make an argument he's the number one corner on the team. They certainly missed him for most of the Stanford game. That's where he got hurt. And they could have used him on Alec Manor on that last play. I'm not going to lie to you guys. So especially with a team like NC State and some of their pass catchers, it's going to be good to get him back. And the final one is Malachi James. He's a true freshman as well, a three-star. He is the fastest person in maybe the history of New Jersey. You can look it up. I'm not the, His 100-meter time is insane. He doesn't really make much of a contribution on offense, but really where you can see him is in the kick return game. That is a place where Syracuse has struggled the last two weeks. So hopefully he's back. He's back returning kicks, and we're not stuck at the 10-yard line now every single time. So we've talked about all of these good things with Syracuse and everything that is going in the, in the right direction that you absolutely love. What concerns you about the Orange? What are the things that keep you up at night before game day saying, oh, man, if this happens, if we see this again, we, we may not get the result we want? So Syracuse has been playing a number of mobile quarterbacks this season, and it's not really necessarily the mobility that's giving them trouble. It's the scheme that they like to run against these mobile quarterbacks, and it's why they're not really generating a lot of pressure, at least from the eye test. They do not generate a lot of pressure on the quarterback because they're rushing three and they're dropping eight in coverage. And it kind of sounds counterintuitive, like, hey, if you're struggling in the secondary, why don't you put more players in the secondary? It hasn't really worked. Every Aside from one play against UNLV, and ironically, it was the biggest play on defense, it really has not worked out. And that is something that keeps me up at night because especially for this week against NC State going against a true freshman, I'm sure, I'm sure as a true freshman back there, 18, 19 years old, whatever C.J. Bailey is, maybe 17 like Ryan Williams, I do not want to see a 300-pounder in my face. Fortunately for him, if you're going up against Syracuse, if they're rushing three and dropping eight, you're probably not going to see a 300 pounder in your face. So 
This team, it doesn't generate a lot of pass rush in part because of their scheming, particularly against mobile quarterbacks that are rushing three and dropping eight. I would love if they can blitz this kid just a little bit more. Last Syracuse question for you before we flip chairs. Give me two X factors on offense and two X factors on defense. I will say I won't go LaQuinn Allen because – he is not really an X-factor. So I'll go the backup in Yassine Willis. He is a, a power back. He can wear down a defense. He's someone who on fourth and one, you want to hand it to him up the gut. It, it's like he's 230 pounds. This kid's got NFL size. He is an X-factor in short yardage situations for this team. I would say the other one on offense is probably Justice Ross Simmons, the guy they're getting back. We haven't really seen him. We don't really know entirely what to expect, but if we can get his full potential, it's going to unlock even more weapons for this team passing-wise. I mean, think about it with Syracuse right now with all their weapons. Another one? We'll take one, right? So those are my two on offense. On defense, I'll go King Joseph Edwards. He is a true freshman. He is a pass rusher. And I believe he's also second on the team in sacks with three. And they all came in one quarter against Holy Cross. And the reason why I bring him up is because he really hasn't played a lot this season aside from those fourth quarter reps against Holy Cross. I want to see him play more. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. This guy is a pass rusher. He's not an every down player right now. I don't think he has the size quite yet. But I want to see him coming off the edge. And the next one I'm going to say is Clarence Lewis because he is a, a corner for this team, a starting corner. You got Marcellus Barnes back now. That should alleviate pressure on him because I like him. He's a good player. He's been more than what I have expected. But now he's your number two corner. If he does his job as a number two corner with Marcellus Barnes, with him on the other side, it's going to be very hard for these NC State pass catchers to get open. Well-rounded Syracuse team. In just a moment, we're going to flip chairs and Jackson will be asking us the NC State questions. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. I love going to live sporting events and honestly, it doesn't really matter what the sport is because I just love the energy in the building and the way I get tickets for games is by using Game Time. Game Time is a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier and Game Time Picks, it filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets and my favorite feature is the curated deals. Curation makes it easier to save more on concerts, sports, comedy, theater, etc., whatever you want. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code Locked On College. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. It's Locked On Crossover Edition. We got Locked On Syracuse, myself, Jackson Holzer, joined by the hosts of Locked On Wolfpack, Grayson Boone and Kenton Gibbs. We just went over everything Syracuse related, what you need to know for this matchup coming up, 8 Eastern in NC State, Syracuse, traveling over there for their second straight road game. All right, time to get to some NC State questions. This was a team in the preseason that had a lot of expectations, right? So first and foremost, what has gone wrong for NC State this year? I mean, I, I think the better question is what is going right for this team? You look at your starting quarterback in the beginning of the season, looking very pedestrian at best, the guy who was all conference, who had all these records and all that. Granted, in the group of five conference, but still a record holder in multiple regards, multiple time player of the year that came out and laid an egg. You look at seniors not earning the bags in their bag year when it's like, hey, this is your time. Scouts are looking and they're like, eh, I, don't, I don't really like money. I want to go learn some enterprise. I'm not sure if the NFL is, is necessarily my thing. And then beyond that, you saw an uncharacteristic. I think the, the biggest thing that I've seen is an uncharacteristic lack of execution in terms of defensively just being where the hell you're supposed to be. The amount of terrible angles I've seen this year, unlike anything I've ever seen from a Tony Gibson coach defense. And it's it's honestly hurtful because there are the guys who are doing it well are 
spectacular. They're doing it amazingly. Unfortunately, we all know football is called the ultimate team sport for a reason because if 10 guys do it right and one does it wrong, if nine guys do it right and two do it wrong, you're, you're going to be out for some very bad results, which is it, it seems to be that's constantly where NC State has been this year. Grayson, before you maybe answer on this question, I just want to provide more context to Kenton's statement right here. NC State on defense this season against Power 4 FBS competition has given up 48 points per game. Obviously, not a recipe for success. So, Grayson, in your mind, what has gone wrong with this team? It's just been very uncharacteristic of a Tony Gibson coach defense and kind of piggybacking off what Kenton was talking about. The execution just hasn't been there. There's only really so much a coaching staff can do. You can put your players in the right position to succeed, but once you're once you're out there, you got to finish the play. You got to you got to finish the tackle. You got to get off the field on third downs, sometimes fourth downs in the fourth quarter against Wake Forest, and it just hasn't been getting done. So, the defense I think has been overall maybe more disappointing than the offense, but yeah, Kenton also mentioned Grayson McCall just didn't really pan out and then certainly had a very scary moment last weekend against Wake Forest, continued well wishes his way. But then that presents the opportunity for true freshman quarterback C.J. Bailey to step up and rise to the occasion. But the offense has been sputtering as well. Casey Concepcion, who was our star wide receiver last year, there's just been a very clear misusage of his talent at the wide receiver spot. So there's been a lot going wrong, very few things going right, and that's why we're sitting at 3-3. Three and three. I also do want to say one thing about that 48 points per game. That the framing of that Here is we a tad bit disingenuous. No, no, no. I mean, let's let's I'm be just honest. Pointing about out that. a stat. Go ahead and you, chime in. It is a stat, but let's be honest about it. You've played the only two teams that are head and shoulders better than you all year. Now, granted, if this continues to keep up across multiple games. I'm not saying that Wake Forest is the most prolific offense that we've ever seen here, but their offense has been known to get it done, even if defensively they haven't matched it. And then you look at Tennessee, who everybody thought, hey, this is a national championship contender. Then you look at Clemson, who has put belt to behind to everybody that they played, not named the University of Georgia. So I think it's a little bit unfair to say, hey, when you play Power 4 teams, this is what you're doing. When you play two of probably the best 15 to 20 Power 4 teams in america okay all right fair enough i was i didn't mean to spark controversy here i was that was, was unintentional controversy here but listen we can get into controversy all we want but that was unintentional i was just pointing out a stat that i looked up uh yesterday for my show let's get to more of a positive note all right because we've talked about what's gone wrong with nc state here I've liked personally what I have seen from CJ Bailey I think that is something that you guys going forward I think you guys might got might have something here what have you seen from CJ Bailey and how much confidence do you have in him going forward? He's been really exciting to watch. You know, true freshman kid didn't exactly expect him to see in a spot like this, but he's really taken the opportunity and run with it. He has a lot of arm talent. He's very poised, very excitable. His demeanor has been one of the most impressive things I've seen from him. It's just very upbeat, very positive all the time. And you certainly hope that bleeds into the rest of the offense because they, they certainly need it right now. But, I think there, there's a very real situation where NC State is kind of already looking into their future, and I think that's why C.J. Bailey, this is his team. He needs to step up and be you know, kind of more experienced than a true freshman is. First game starting on the road is at Clemson. He wasn't the reason we lost, and so ultimately, what more can you ask of the kid? He comes in late to an L.A. Tech game. He wins you that ball game. He does well enough to win against Northern Illinois, and he certainly was not the reason that we lost against Wake Forest either, so... He's been, he's been good at taking control of the ball. I would like to see the playbook open up a bit more. I think that has been, in a sense, holding CJ back. We want to really see what this kid can do if he's going to be our quarterback of the future. I like it. I don't love it. I like it. I think he's been good. I wouldn't say, hey, that is this is his team for the next three to four years. However long it is before he goes to the NFL, this is his team. I'm not going to say that much, but he has shown, like Grayson talked about, a lot of that poise, a lot of that, hey, I'm the same guy. I'm excited about everything. Even when things aren't going my way, my body language is, not huh, well, you know, because we've struggled with that in the past and seeing some other young guys who, who came in at quarterback have very, very terrible body language, which was so bad. It was, it was noted by the fans and, and viewers and whatnot. So I love that about CJ Bailey. I also love the fact he's not scared to let it rip. Yeah. I tell people all the time, a lot of people get confused when I say, oh, play the young guys 
I, I don't just say play the young guys. I say if you're going to lose, lose with the young guys. So what does that mean? He's going to make the young mistakes. He's I believe there was a fire zone against uh, – or, yes, there was a fake fire zone or a fake all-out blitz by Northern Illinois where they had both of their linebackers mugged up in the A-gap. Looks like they're bringing six. The two linebackers drop out. It's a, uh, it's a cover two look. But the reality – and he threw it right to the linebacker. Thank God that young man had hands of stone. But with that in mind, I say to myself, he's a freshman. He's going to make that moment. He's going to have that moment where he's like, oh, man, they're definitely coming. And, and he's proven wrong. And I'm OK with that. I'm fine with that. Again, the only thing that I am not fine with, the only thing that I'm like, please don't. What what happens here is I would like to see a little bit more of a clutch gene out of him. But but even in that moment against Wake Forest, where he throws that interception on the first drive or on the first play of the last drive of the game where NC State can go for it and win it, I look at that and say, hey, I think back to Kobe when he was with the Lakers and, and he when he when they played the Jazz and Malone and Stockton were still there, he shot them out of those games. And I believe it was games three and four. And they go on to get swept because of that. So I'm not ever going to get mad at an 18 year old for doing it wrong. You're good. Keep going. Keep balling. He's going to grow. And not only his growth, but Anderson and Jackson. And you look at all these other guys that are super young. They're going to have multiple years together. If they desire it, I think they'll be just fine. I think he'll be just fine. I think him and those pass guys together, they're going to be a phenomenal group. Kenton, on that mistake that you alluded to, I mean, I even see veteran quarterbacks across all levels make that mistake. Yeah. Or you, you just get fooled. It's going to happen with a true freshman or not. He could have been McCall back there. He could have made that exact same mistake. And I don't really think it was – it's fair to say, well, he's a true freshman on that because it's a mistake that any quarterback can make. Failing to diagnose a blitz or a misread, whatever it is. But I have liked so far what I have seen from C.J. Bailey. I think that is certainly a bright spot, and it's at the game's most important position going forward. So that's a bright spot, obviously, for NC State. Now, listen, all right, we don't have to get into the whole uh, stat-wise here with NC State's defense, and we're not going to go there. Here we but go. Here we go. our <laughs> playing against Syracuse here has been, uh, I don't know if you've checked, but they're known to be uh, putting up some points. So how do you view the matchup-wise on defense? I mean, I, I don't think that this is bad as the stats say, because I think the stats are deceptive on both sides here a little bit. So hear me out. Um, the Ohio Bobcats, is that a team you think of as like, a, oh, that defense is coming. They're downhill and humming. They, they don't play no games. Are you talking the, about Ohio State by chance, the Buckeyes? Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about the Ohio Bobcats, the green and white. You oh, know. no, I, I don't. I, okay, I don't Georgia Tech, it, is that a team that you think of? And you're like, hey. Let me tell you something now. When the rambling wreck is coming, when you hear those bees are buzzing, you know what's going on down defensively. I wouldn't say they have the most prolific defense, but they are pretty good. Okay. And then you go forward from there. And after Georgia Tech, you had uh, Stanford. Is, is, is the, is, you know, are we thinking Stanford's a great defense? Nope. UNLV by chance? Well, they were a ranked team on the road. Holy Cross. Oh, no, they were the most prolific defense. It, is Holy Cross a great defense? Are we looking at ACUs in the building, y'all? We know hide the kids, hide your wife. They blitz in everybody. Holy Cross is not a great defense. No, they are okay, not. Okay, so, so I think that it's a little deceptive on both ends, but I think that this game will go a long way in telling the story for both. And I think that where NC State will have a better shot than most people would give them credit for is one of their strengths has been that defensive line all year long Davin Van has played like a man possessed he is playing like he knows my NFL future is right here the bag is right here but his partner in crime Brandon Cleveland oh my god he gives centers headaches those boys are faking migraines to get away from him because he has been unblockable this year so I think that that plus a secondary that in coverage in coverage we ain't gonna talk about the run fits in coverage a secondary that has been pretty good this year i think it's a situation where fighters don't make fights styles make fights and i think these two styles work out very well for nc state i think it's a very intriguing matchup for nc state's secondary because like kenton just mentioned there their pass coverage is supposed to be one of the strengths of the defense now they haven't exactly been tested all that much because we've been getting steamrolled on the ground tennessee ran right through us clemson ran right through us We've had struggles with NIU. We've had struggles with FCS teams in stopping the run. So 
Syracuse, we know that they air this thing out 48 plus times a game. If they continue that trend, I do think it creates a very interesting matchup because it could be strength on strength. So we're going to have to see if NC State can stop them on the ground. But I think it's interesting that you said LaQuint Allen isn't an X factor because I think he very well could be. I, I don't think he's an X factor because I think he's too good to be an X factor. That's fair. He, because like It's like me saying, oh, Rondé Gadsden's an X factor for certain. <laughs> yeah. like, no, he's not. He's a factor. An yeah. X factor is someone who you might not necessarily expect to be a factor, but becomes one. So that's why I said it's not LaQuinn Allen. It's the backup you've seen, Willis, who's more of a power back that can wear down that defensive line that NC State has. And I think to your guys' point, I said this on yesterday's podcast I had on Neil Adler with it. I said, look, NC State's pass defense, sixth in the ACC. That's pretty good. You dive a little deeper, pass yards per attempt. They're pretty good in that category as well because that shows you pass yards per attempt that, hey, even when the team is throwing the ball, they're not getting a lot of yards out of it. I sometimes like that stat more than just pure yards. So it's almost like a strength on strength here, and it's like, okay, can Syracuse have their homecoming game moment with their running game? Can it finally get unlocked against this NC State defense? All right, now let's switch to the other side of the ball here. If you're Syracuse, you're on offense. What are you on the lookout for with NC State? What are you trying to do? Oh, well, I I, I think that's a very, very simple, uh, very simple answer. I want to get the DBs involved in the running game. That's what I want to do. I want to make sure, hey, uh, Aiden White, Bishop Fitzgerald, get it right every time. Hey, DK Kaufman, come on down here. You fill a hole. Feel it the right way. Let's see. Let's see if you can do it because there have been multiple teams that challenge us to do that. And Wake Forest in particular um, are locked on look of the week, actually, in which we break down a play every week. What the play in particular was basically Wake Forest saying, We will live, we will leave not only one, but two of your defensive backs unblocked. Don't not unaccounted for because there was supposed to be a block on one of them, but the wide receiver was a very unwilling participant in that. Uh, scheme. He just kind of sat there and was like, oh, well, if you if you want to make the play, I ain't going to stop you. And yet RDB said, mm, I don't really feel like it. So um, I think that that's that's the goal. If you're wanting if you're wanting to play NC State, because objectively speaking, that's what teams have done. If you look at the shovel passes by Tennessee, what was the goal of that? Let the defensive lineman come upfield and then boom, once you're behind them, go ahead and throw something behind that. You look at Clemson and what they did a lot. It was a lot of, hey, we are going to get you all going the wrong way, or we're going to trick you a little bit in terms of getting your linebackers out of position. We're going to make your DBs fit the run, and we're going to find out whether or not they can do it. The first touchdown of the game, a 55-yarder, was a direct result of an improper run fit by another safety. So if I am looking at NC State and I'm saying, how do we beat this team? I say, hey, address the first level first. We, I don't give a damn what we got to do, double, triple, however you got to do it. Because second level and beyond, I'm not sure about their run fits. I I would be okay with that. I'm not okay with Brandon Cleveland eating up both A-gaps. So we need to do something to address that. But everything beyond that, eh, let's, let's take our chances. If I'm Syracuse on Saturday night, I might want to utilize a quick passing game because that's also something that's burned NC State on multiple occasions. You do have to make sure you know where number three is at all times. That's Aiden White. He's our best corner. He struggled a little bit up until this point of the season, but in pass coverage, he started to look more like himself uh, last Saturday against Wake Forest. And then, yeah, kind of piggybacking off Kenton again there, the linebacking play has been a massive question mark coming into the season. It's been a massive question through six games in the season. If Syracuse can successfully manipulate the NC State linebackers, they're going to essentially be able to get whatever they want. If you can spread the field in the way that Kyle McCord does, I think it's going to be an uphill battle for NC State. But I do want to reiterate the secondary for NC State. They haven't been tested quite yet. This will be their biggest test to date. So we're going to have to see if they can get it done. All right, let's get into some predictions after a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. And you'll get started with 200 hours in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet in Syracuse football, speaking of college, 
Syracuse football is a four and a half point favorite against NC State on Saturday night with its money line at minus 194. If you like those odds in either direction, you can bet it right now on FanDuel. That's FanDuel.com. Last couple of minutes here of our Thursday crossover episode. We're going to get into our final thoughts, final predictions, and then we're going to give our score predictions as well. Before we get to these scores, Jackson, we like to kind of reverse the field here at the very end and ask you if NC State is to win this game, fill in the blank. What happens? If NC State wins the game, it's because CJ Bailey had his best game of the year and took advantage of the fact that Syracuse doesn't like to bring a lot of players. They don't like to blitz a whole lot. And he just carved up that secondary from start to finish. And then Kenton, I'll flip that over to you before I give my answer. If Syracuse wins this ball game, what happens? Oh boy, there's a myriad of ways that that could happen, but I'll say the most likely uh, scenario in which Syracuse wins this ball game, and that would simply be that um, they forced missed tackles after the catch. I would probably say that's the biggest way that Syracuse can win this game because. Their wide receiver core, wide receiving core, their pass catching core studs. They got guys all over the place that, you know, if you miss a tackle, there's a reason LaQuint Allen is second on the team in receptions. They know if he can make you, if you get the ball in his hands, he can make you miss. If he can make you miss, it could be Katie Diggs by the door for number one. They could be strike up the band, get the little dancing orange in the end zone because we're going to be celebrating all night long on your squad. So I think if, if Syracuse can force miss tackles, they win this ball game fairly easily if if NC State is struggling to get guys on the ground. I think NC State failing to contain both Gadsden and Pena is a surefire way for Syracuse to secure a victory here. They're going to try and air it out. They want to test the NC State defense because they really haven't been able to prove much uh, through halfway point of the season. If Kyle McCord can successfully locate his receivers, make all the throws, and avoid making bad mistakes, and he does have six interceptions, some of them have been pretty ugly. But Kyle McCord also does have a propensity to make very good throws. So if he can avoid the the bad turnovers in in this game, if Syracuse can win the turnover margin, I think that they're just playing better football right now, flat out. NC State has been getting in their own way, both play calling and just pure execution. Syracuse is going to enter with a lot of confidence. And I think if they execute at a high level, they should win this game. Now, Jackson, give us your score prediction before we get into ours. Well, of course, I'm going to pick Syracuse. I mean, trust me, I'm not too big of a homer. At some point in this season, I will pick Syracuse to lose, but they're favored. So I will pick Syracuse to win this game 35-27. Kenton, what do you got? I I just want to save it, okay? I don't like Jackson. I don't like Kyle McCord. (laughs) I don't like the the Syracuse. I don't like the way that Syracuse fans are wonderful people, and it's hard to dislike them. That upsets me a little bit because Syracuse fans really are some of the best fans in the ACC. And I, I'm hoping for some trolls to say something where I'm like, ah, that's why I don't like you. But they're just such wonderful people, which is so contrary to what everybody thinks about the Northeast. I don't like it. I don't like it. So I'm, I'm not I'm not likable. You don't like me? What's going on? No, you're, you're, you're not like You're the one. You're the one that's not likable. You're the one New York, New Yorker. That's you. But everything else about this, everything else about this situation is something I don't like, but I hate the way NC State has played as a play. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And with that being said, I have to pick Syracuse in this one. I mean, you let down the CW magic, for Christ's sake, in the last game. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe NC State lost on the CW. That's that's just very disappointing. And maybe I got to go back and call him the UPN because his mama named him UPN. So maybe that's what we got to do now since the CW magic is gone. But in all seriousness, I see this as a game that, like Grayson said, Syracuse is just playing better ball right now, and confidence is a bad mother. And right now, Syracuse has it on their side. Regardless of who they played so far this season, regardless of, whoa, if our teams that we played played your teams, eh, that don't matter. What does matter is Syracuse is feeling confident. I believe these two teams are close enough of a level to where that confidence gives Syracuse a definitive boost. And with that being said, I'm going to go Syracuse 38, NC State 24. Yeah, I hate to make it a clean sweep here, but until NC State can play a complete football game, I'm going to have doubts that they can do it. They're 0 for 6 
in playing a full game where it looks like they exerted their maximum potential. 0 for 6. I think, unfortunately, on Saturday night, it's going to go 0 for 7. The offense has been sputtering. You saw some confidence from C.J. Bailey, and you certainly hope that can continue, but it's going to be dependent on the coaches letting him throw it. You have to let C.J. open up the field with his arm talent because otherwise you get so predictable in the way that you use Casey Concepcion or you get very ineffective in the run game. Until that is cured, I have doubts about NC State winning this game. So I'm going to take the Syracuse Orange by a score of 31 to 24 in Carter Finley. It's going to be painful, but uh, that's the way I see this thing going. I will tell you this, much like I said about the Wake Forest game, I also feel about this game. The Wake Forest game, I said no outcome would surprise me other than Wake Forest blowing this team out. That would have been the only thing that surprised me. Literally no outcome would surprise me here. Syracuse getting a blowout wouldn't surprise me here. NC State getting a blowout would not surprise me here. I just, I don't know why this feels like the game where NC State is for some reason, expectations are the lowest. People are talking about basketball. Apathy is about to start setting in. And all of a sudden it's like, ha ha, here's the run. Here's the team you've been waiting on all year. And it feels like a great moment to do that. So while I am picking Syracuse, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked if, if Grayson and I find ourselves in post game saying, did we do the thing? Did we do it? And, and don't be surprised if you see me post game being like, uh, what happened here? <laughs> what, 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 what went wrong? How did we lose? I'm telling you what, guys. I mean, I'm not, this game stares the bejesus out of me. We got a clean sweep all here. We're all picking Syracuse to win. The bookmakers are saying that Syracuse is going to win. NC State has gotten beaten up. You know, you said it, not me. You know, they're looking forward to basketball season. I actually did say that. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, we're, we're coming in confident. We, we just won a second-ranked game. I'm telling you what, the expectations have been risen, and that stares me. A lot. So I I just hope that, you know, Syracuse just finds a way to win anyway. This is weirdly enough the spot where NC State tends to overperform. So like Kenta was talking about, it wouldn't surprise us necessarily if they suddenly have their stuff together and they come out with a win. But until then, we have our doubts. Big thank you to Locked On Syracuse host Jackson Holzer for joining us here on our Locked On crossover episode on Thursday. That will do it for us. Locked On Wolfpack, Locked On Syracuse. Be sure to both like and subscribe to both of these channels. Jackson does great work for the Syracuse community up there in New York. Excellent channel, Jackson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And you guys do awesome work too. Be sure that after the game, after checking out my podcast post game, you check out Grayson and Kenton because they'll break down the game as well. Looking forward to a good showdown on Saturday night. We'll see you all after the game.